Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar this afternoon, Bicycle Helmet Promotion in Children. What's the evidence? We are going to be reviewing the systematic review by Owen et al., non-legislative interventions for the promotion of cycle helmet wearing by children. And there is the summary statement um, that's available on the link here, healthevidence.ca. Just a few housekeeping items. We're going to use the question and answer to post comments and questions during the webinar. Send questions to all. Um, we recommend sending the questions to all, not privately to the host. And we recommend that um, you're using a wired internet connection, not wireless, to help prevent connection challenges. We've posted the WebEx 24-7 helpline number also in the chat if you need to refer to that for if you have any technical issues during the webinar. So I'm going to turn over the microphone to Dr. Maureen Dobbins, who is going to present today's webinar. Thank you, uh, Jenny. That was uh, Dr. Jenny Yost, who is also a member of our team, who is uh, helping me out on the technical side of uh, things today, as some of our team are um, either uh, uh, attending a conference. Karen Corby is in Australia right now. Uh, Heather Husson welcomed a new baby to her family, a, a son, Elliot, a few weeks ago. And uh, Robin Trainer is uh, working on our East Coast uh, office out in Nova Scotia. Uh, but thank you to all of you who are joining us today for the webinar on uh, bicycle helmets and the effectiveness of that with children. Um, please excuse me. I'm just in the process of uh, recovering from uh, a head cold earlier this week, so this will be the, probably the longest I've actually spoken in about four days. So hopefully my voice stays with me. We're uh, just doing a poll right now asking you uh, um, where you're from today and uh, nice to see that we actually have representation from coast to coast, Newfoundland to uh, British Columbia, uh, with also people joining us from uh, Saskatchewan, Ontario and Quebec. So welcome uh, to all of you who filled, uh, filled in that poll. For those of you who've joined us previously, we do ask uh, some polling questions from time to time uh, throughout the webinar, and it's just to give us a little bit of information about who's on the line, and we also ask you a few questions as we go uh, in terms of um, some of your knowledge of some key concepts. Uh, so for those of you who are new, this is the health evidence team. Uh, we're, we're missing Dr. Yo's picture, but we'll make sure we have that up for future webinars. Uh, so just to put a face to a name, if we actually were to uh, ever see you at conferences like um, Canadian Public Health Association or other relevant uh, um, conferences that we regularly attend, you'll know who to look for. So uh, just uh, very briefly about health evidence because I'm, I'm hoping uh, that uh, with uh, some of you who may have joined us before, you're actually getting sick of hearing me talk about what, what is health evidence, but for anyone who's new on the line, uh, health evidence uh, has a mandate of trying to facilitate the incorporation of the best public health effectiveness evidence into public health practice. And part of the way we do this is by finding that uh, evidence on the effectiveness of public health, compiling it in one place, assessing the methodological quality, and then distilling that uh, evidence into more easily in interpretable messages, and hence uh, these, uh, uh, these webinars that we've been doing uh, for the past eight months is one of those mechanisms that we're using. And with the goal of ensuring that we uh, are helping to facilitate the most effective public health decisions uh, that we can in Canada. Uh, health evidence, again, why use it? Well, we hope uh, that it saves time. We do a very comprehensive search of major databases around the world looking for any evidence evaluating the public, uh, public health interventions. That's been summarized at the level of a review doesn't necessarily have to be a systematic review or a meta-analysis, but it has to be a compilation of more than one study, and we need to know a little bit about uh, how the authors uh, searched for those studies. 
So it should save you time in, in terms of not having to go to the large databases to find that evidence. Everything that you find in health evidence is uh, directly relevant to public health practice and is also current. At any given time, we are uh, likely only about two months behind the actual publication, which uh, in terms of uh, reviews relevant for public health would only constitute a very small number that would be missed. We try to use a very transparent process, so everything that we do, how we decide which reviews make it into the uh, into health evidence, how we assess the methodological quality, how we assign keywords, how we write our summaries, all of those processes are there for you uh, to see and to uh, judge uh, in terms of the quality that we're doing and, and certainly we uh, invite any comments or questions that you have and you can access us through the contact us uh, link on the website. We also know through um, over 10 years now of working quite uh, intensely with health departments to uh, move towards evidence informed decision making, not necessarily move towards but to uh, make this a routine part of decision making, that access to the evidence is only one part of the equation and that there are many supports that are required for an organization to develop the knowledge, skill, capacity and infrastructure to practice in an evidence informed way. So in addition to the uh, website itself or to the registry uh, of effectiveness reviews, we've also been developing uh, additional, uh, we call them evidence informed or EIDM supports. One of those is, as, as some of you will be aware of our knowledge brokering work, where a knowledge broker works one on one with health departments and multiple staff within health departments to develop those knowledge skill culture and infrastructure. We also have created a number of tools along the way that would support public health decision makers as they engage in each step of the EIDM process. And really, quite importantly, um, the last item here, easy to use, we really uh, strive to ensure that health evidence is a site that's easy to, to use by public health uh, professionals. Um, you should know that uh, in the next month or so we will be relaunching a completely new revamped uh, site um, and we have listened to the comments and feedback that we've received over the last number of years and really uh, used those in redesigning health evidence and I'm sure, I hope that, that uh, you will find it to be e even more user friendly once that is launched and we certainly would uh, like to hear your thoughts and again ongoing feedback once we have that uh, launched. So stay tuned for more uh, materials about when that launch will actually be happening. It's important for us to point out uh, that this series of knowledge translation um, uh, webinars are being supported by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research from the knowledge translation supplement uh, project grants that we were successful uh, in receiving uh, about a year ago. So just to remind you to make sure we're all on the, on the right line here that uh, today is uh, we're, we're summarizing the findings by Owen et al. This is actually an update of a previous review uh, that was published by uh, Kendrick a few years ago. This is a, uh, this is a review that has been published in the uh, Cochrane Library and, and one that then was uh, included in the health evidence uh, registry. We, we chose this topic because uh, it seems uh, fairly timely, it's, it's uh, definitely an, an issue with respect to uh, injury prevention for uh, public health across the country and because this was a, a newly published review, um, I thought it was important to, to present these uh, new findings of additional studies that have been found since uh, the initial review was published. I have questions there, so um, I might just take a moment there if anyone has a question they'd like to pose before I just jump right into the results. Just pausing there for a moment. And I do see that we uh, have had someone join from um, Manitoba, so welcome, glad to have you on the line. Okay, so I'm just going uh, to move on. 
and actually uh, look at, so let's talk about the PICO. So PICO is a, a, a template that we use to help us define what the research question is or what the practice-based issue is that we are uh, uh, trying to address and answer. Uh, we are just asking you right now in a polling question if you have heard of PICO before. What we've uh, heard uh, so far is it's usually about 50-50, about half of you have heard of this terminology and, and the other half haven't, which is why we keep asking the question. But PICO we find is a very useful template to use to really focus in on what the issue is that needs to be addressed and what those various components are. So the P stands for the population you want to know about, the I relates to the intervention, uh, that you are interested in learning about. The C is what is it, what's the intervention being compared to? This could be whatever is the standard of care or it could be no intervention. And then the O is uh, the outcome. So what's the main primary outcome that you're interested in knowing about? And uh, in using this template with public health decision makers for a number of years now, what we found is that uh, using this terminology really achieves two things. It helps to really um, uh, become much clearer from a decision maker perspective in terms of what, what the question is or the issue that they are um, wanting to address and in creating uh, and actually writing down uh, terms that coincide with each component of PICO, you end up then creating the types of keywords that you could be using in conducting your own search uh, of the literature. So you could use that coming to health evidence or you could use that in going to any other database. It kind of sets up that preliminary thinking and types of keywords that, that you uh, would, could start with. And so I see here today that uh, actually a few more of you haven't heard of PICO and, uh, than uh, have, so hopefully uh, you um, might think about using this in the future. So what we know about uh, this Owen review is that the population is focused on children and adolescents, 0 to 18 years. The interventions uh, being evaluated are those to promote bicycle helmet use that did not require the enactment of legislation. So I'll be talking a little bit more about those, but for example, uh, it, it could include uh, educational strategies, it could include uh, the provision of free helmets, um, so various interventions like that. It, this was being compared to either what was already the standard of care or no intervention. And then there were actually three distinct uh, outcomes uh, that were the primary outcomes in this review. So one of them was observed bicycle helmet wearing. So what we would hope to be a, an objective um, measurement of the outcome. Uh, there was also self-reported bicycle helmet ownership and then self-reported bicycle helmet wearing. So those were the three main outcomes that were covered. And then you see at the bottom of the slide here, quality rating 9 in parentheses strong. So what this tells you is that in our assessment of how well this review was done, so the methods that were used to synthesize uh, these multiple studies um, received a, a rating of 9 out of 10 uh, possible points and therefore can be considered to be a very strong review, so the methodological uh, quality is strong and therefore we should have um, some um, good level of confidence in the findings presented in the review. So the overall uh, findings of the review uh, are that the non-legislative interventions, so for example community-based interventions, those that, that happened within the school setting, so school-based, as well as the provision of free helmets led to an increased odds of observed helmet wearing and self-reported helmet wearing. So in, in both measures of, of helmet wearing, whether it was observed or self-reported, these three types of interventions led to a positive effect, i.e. increased helmet wearing. 
Um, however, the findings must be interpreted cautiously, uh, given that there were significant differences across the study findings, and also, importantly, that uh, this next, the next term here, moderate to high risk of bias, which tells us that the, the individual studies included in this review had a number of uh, issues with respect to the design of those studies, which actually does have an impact on um, uh, um, the level of confidence we can have in each of those studies together. And then that paired with the fact that those uh, findings varied a bit from study to study also gives us a bit of cause for concern. And then, and then of course, uh, we always need to be concerned with self-reported outcomes in terms of the level of um, uh, reliability and validity that we uh, that goes along with uh, self-reported outcomes when in particular it's for outcomes that have um, you know a certain type of social desirability and so in this case most children would probably recognize that they're supposed to be wearing helmets so they might be more likely to tell us they're wearing a helmet than in fact they truly are so all of those things together just make us a little bit we, um, we need to be thinking cautiously even though we did see in this review a positive effect but I'll talk to you a little bit more about the specific findings in a moment in terms of the general implications for public health, uh, our sense is that public health should either promote, support, or implement. Those are written because uh, uh, the scope of public health practice varies considerably across Canada, and in some settings, uh, the, the mandate of public health might be to promote these interventions, and other times it might be to support others in doing them, and sometimes they might be the ones doing it themselves. So this, it's all of these things together uh, that public health could be doing. Uh, however, the evidence would suggest uh, the support for community or school-based interventions to improve both observed and self-reported helmet wearing, uh, to focus interventions on those less than 12 years of age to improve observed helmet wearing, the provision of free helmets uh, with inclusion of education also improved the odds of observed or self-reported helmet wearing. And the provision of interventions delivered in healthcare settings uh, also increase, led to an increase in observed hel helmet wearing. And then, um, as we always have in research, so the, the small caveats are at the bottom here. And again, some things that we need to just be uh, aware of uh, in terms of thinking about how we use this evidence is that in most instances we uh, don't have a lot of evidence. So some of these findings are based on uh, two studies. Again, the quality, the methodological quality of the individual studies, uh, there's some issues there. And so this might mean that the positive effect may be overestimated. In terms of the long-term effectiveness of these interventions, this is, uh, remains unknown at this time. Um, and that when we did, uh, and that not we, when the authors did uh, sub-analysis, so when they then further divided and compared community-based interventions uh, versus a control, uh, some of those analyses included studies that were at a high risk of bias. So again, that has, uh, it has an impact on our level of confidence in those findings. Uh, and this review did not evaluate whether non-legislated interventions promoting the wearing of helmets resulted in fewer head injuries sustained by children. So this is really important as well in terms of the scope of this review uh, uh, focuses on whether or not non-legislative interventions lead to increased wearing of helmets and ownership of helmets. However, it's not able to say if 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 you have these interventions and children wear helmets, uh, and uh, does this result in fewer head injuries by children and adolescents? Uh, I'm not familiar as to whether or not uh, the same team uh, is working on a Cochrane review that looks at that outcome. Um, but essentially, I think to have a full picture uh, for decision making in public health, we would want to have some additional data on that outcome as well. 
So again, these are um, <coughs> there are other outcomes discussed in this review for which data was not provided. Uh, so in our summary of the evidence, we focused only on those outcomes for which outcome data was actually provided in the review. So um, uh, our reasoning behind that is it's always really important to be able to see the data uh, yourself. Uh, and because we weren't able to see the other data, then we've chosen to not uh, focus on, on uh, reporting those. However, that might be useful for you uh, to take a look at that if you were looking at the full review. So I just want to look a little bit more closely at the specific findings. So if we look at observed helmet wearing, and, and this is a really good place to start because we would um, prefer to look at this, this outcome as opposed to the uh, self-reported helmet wearing uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, we would hope in a, uh, an assumption here that observed helmet wearing would be would lead to a more truthful answer uh, than across a population being asked to self-report. One of the things to point out here that that uh, would be um, an important piece of information to know as, uh, around that observation is in designing those individual studies you would really want those observers to have no idea who had received the intervention or not. And in, in designing uh, a trial, a randomized control trial, in that way, by blinding our observers to know who received an intervention or not, that would allow us to uh, achieve uh, much greater confidence that the findings are um, approaching the truth. Um, so what we saw here is that overall interventions increase the odds of observed helmet wearing. And we see here overall uh, those who exposed to uh, non-legislative uh, interventions to promote bicycle helmet wearing, we saw uh, they were two times, just a little over two times more likely to uh, be observed wearing a helmet with that confidence interval ranging from uh, about one and a third to uh, three and a third times more likely. And uh, what you're also seeing in the smaller text is now when we the analysis was done to then compare community-based interventions uh, versus uh, usual care or none, the school-based interventions uh, or the, and or the provision of free helmets, we see different odds ratios as well as confidence intervals. So there are a lot of numbers on this table. I'm going to show you a graph in a moment uh, to explain this a little bit more. But really the key message to, to see here is that the community-based interventions had an odds ratio of 4.3. So children exposed to the community-based interventions had an odds of um, more than four times more likely to be observed wearing a helmet. And this ranged from two and a quarter to eight and a quarter times more likely. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a more positive finding than what we observe for school-based. Sorry, I keep saying we. I think that's because I do my own reviews. It's not we. It's the, the, uh, the review authors, Owen et al. Um, uh, however, in school-based, we see uh, a, a fairly smaller odds ratio, but still a positive one at just under two times more likely with the odds, uh, with confidence interval ranging from just over one, so the 0.03 to 2.91. Uh, and that's with eight studies. And then we, we see a jump up again. The provision of free helmets, we're back up to that odds of 4.35, the range uh, going from 2.13 to 8.89. Uh, we also see for the population 12 years of age and under, again, um, an odds ratio of 2.5 and the range going from 1.17 to 5.37. So uh, interestingly here, overall, when we take all of these interventions together, we see uh, 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 two times greater odds. Uh, of uh, observed helmet wearing, um, but important in terms of looking at this sub-analysis that uh, free helmets and community-based seem to fare better, produce uh, more positive results than school-based. Important to point out here that uh, in the analysis that was done, um, 
there, there was no direct comparison of comparing community-based to school-based or community-based to the provision of free helmets. So these are uh, single comparisons from community-based to either what was already there or to no intervention. So each of those is, has been compared. Um, it would be interesting to uh, think about in a head-to-head -head, uh, uh, analysis of community-based versus school-based uh, what we would see because it doesn't always just automatically turn out um, exactly as, as we might think. Uh, I'll talk to you in a moment when um, I show you a forest plot or the, the um, the way to, uh, in a picture, show you these results, what um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll describe a little bit more the statistical significance uh, using the confidence interval, but all of these findings are statistically significant, and we know that they're all statistically significant because in all of these instances, the odds ratio is above 1.0. So that would be what we would refer to as the line of no effect, and if the lower end of the confidence interval was below one, then we would be able to tell from the confidence interval that it was not a statistically, um, statistically significant effect. And then just the last point uh, at the bottom uh, here where uh, there was no impact observed with interventions providing subsidized helmets with education. So when we uh, partially pay for uh, helmets and provide some education, this isn't leading to uh, an increased um, uh, observed helmet wearing. We had asked you uh, a question just as I um, just as I started to speak there about uh, did, do you know how to interpret odds ratios? And there we had just a few more of you, just a couple percent more had indicated that, that you uh, are familiar with interpreting it. So hopefully this was just a bit of a, a refresher for you and hopefully that was useful for those of you uh, who said that uh, you were not, um, did not know how to interpret that. So if you were to open up the Owen uh, Cochrane Review, download that, you would find in it this type of a graph. Uh, this, uh, our table I'll call it, has uh, lots of information in it. When I ask public health decision makers, what do you usually do when you uh, see something like this on the page, uh, I get lots of uh, answers, but the one I hear most frequently is turn the page as fast as possible because you don't like seeing these. They, they seem uh, intimidating and um, very hard to interpret. And I guess what I'm hoping you'll leave here with today is uh, feeling better about looking at these types of, uh, we call them forest plots or blobograms, uh, and feeling like you actually can make sense of what all of this um, means. If you were to look down, I'm just going to break it down a little bit for you. If you were to look, uh, look at the column on the far left-hand side, it says study or subgroup. This simply is listing out for you all of the primary studies that uh, were included in, in this analysis. Uh, so it gives you the name of the author and when the paper was published. And then the next column, it says experimental uh, with a small n and um, a big N, a capital N, and then the same for control. So this simply uh, tells us here how many people uh, were in each of the experimental and control group in each of the studies. And the, the small n, so the first number, tells us how many events were observed in, in those groups. And so, for example, for the first one, we see that 164 of 185 children in the experimental group were observed wearing their helmet, whereas in the control it was 24 of 39. So that's just giving us our numbers and what's nicely added up for us at the end, uh, there are the uh, overall numbers for each of those groups. Then we have uh, right uh, in the middle there under odds ratio. So we have all the horizontal lines with uh, squares sort of in the middle of them. Uh, and what those are, those are the individual results from each study. So the square is the actual um, number finding from each study and the horizontal line is the confidence interval. So each study uh, should report 
an overall effect size as well as a confidence interval. And so you see all of those. Uh, a pretty common question I get is, you know, what's, what, what's going on with these squares? Why are they all different sizes? And uh, there's a very good uh, answer for that. And so if you were to look at the next column, which is weight, and you see different numbers there, 11.8%, 3.7, 3.4. Uh, I think the largest one we see is 15.1. So if you were to actually look at all of the weighting and then compare it back to the size of the square, you would likely end up seeing that the size of the square correlates to the um, how big that number is. So basically, uh, uh, for example, the one that is 15.1%, that study uh, looks like Parkin. Um, represented 15% of the weight of the overall answer when all of these studies get, uh, we'll say, aggregated together. So when we add all of these studies up to come up with one overall finding, Parkin, the Parkin findings exerted the greatest amount of influence on that overall uh, finding. So that's all that tells you there. So the other, th now if we go back to the odds ratio column where we now have the uh, depicted in a linear format for us, the effect size and the confidence interval, uh, we see that some of those uh, confidence intervals are small and some of those lines are actually quite long. And the difference there being, if we were to compare the first two studies, so the first study is actually a fairly short, uh, fairly um, narrow line, and the next study below it by Cote is actually a fairly long line. If we go back and look at the size of those two studies, we would actually see that BRIT is a much larger study, has a little over 200 uh, students uh, in the study, whereas the second one has just over 50. So that's what we also find is that the smaller our studies, then the less um, confidence we have in that finding, that leads to a much broader confidence uh, interval. And when we have um, larger studies, we actually have a much more narrow confidence interval. So the, uh, I just have two more things I'll point out about this column. You'll also see that some of the confidence intervals uh, don't touch um, that vertical line down the middle. And if you follow that line all the way to the bottom, uh, you'll see the number one. And then on the left-hand side of it, we see the words favors control. And on the right-hand side, we see favors experimental. So that line um, that's in this instance labeled as one is what we call the line of no effect. And if the confidence interval for for each study, if that confidence interval touches the line of no effect, then that tells us uh, that there was no difference uh, in observed helmet wearing in the control group versus the experimental group. In this instance, we want to see, we would really like to see more helmet wearing. And so results that fall on the right-hand side, so are greater than one, are a good thing. That's telling us that those those children exposed to the intervention were, um, had a greater odds of wearing, uh, uh, being observed wearing helmets than those who didn't get the intervention. So one of the things we can see as we go down uh, this list is there are um, looks like three studies that actually had a statistically significant positive effect. That's Brit. Uh, Liller and Perkin. Uh, so, and we know that because the confidence intervals of those three studies do not touch the line of no effect, and all of the other studies do touch the line of line of no effect, which tells us that in those studies they did not see a difference between those exposed and those not exposed to the intervention. But sometimes what happens in studies is is if we have a small study then we don't have enough power. You may have heard that term before, but we don't actually have enough strength in the study to actually see a real difference. So for example, with Cote, uh, where we have just over 50 people, it might be that there just weren't 
um, enough study and enough children in the study, and there weren't enough observations of the event uh, to capture in the data in order to see a statistically significant difference. So that's why we do meta-analysis, because it allows us to take these, these, um, the data from many, many studies so that we have a much larger sample size to give us a better reflection of what all of the evidence is saying overall. So the last thing I just want to point out here is to draw your attention to now the diamond, the black diamond that, I, that is at the bottom of all of those individual lines. And that diamond now represents this aggregation of the findings from all of these individual studies into an overall effect size and then a 95% confidence interval. And so the first thing to point out here is that the diamond does not touch the line of no effect. So that tells us that overall, when we look at all of these studies, the findings of all of these studies, um, that these interventions led to a statistically significant increase in the odds of observed helmet wearing. So we see a positive effect there. And now if I just draw your attention to the final column, and the final column is just the, the written text. It's the actual numbers that coincide with the lines that are in the middle of our graph here. So if we, we look there, there, that's where we see our 2.08, so just over two times um, greater odds of wearing, uh, of observed helmet wearing with the range going from the 1.29 to the 3.34. So overall, that gives us a sense of uh, what the impact is of uh, these interventions. So um, I'm just reading a, a question that was posed. Um, was intervention of free helmet wearing analyzed within community-based uh, settings? Uh, and um, in, in, uh, in quickly re-looking at the review uh, on what was done is uh, no, this wasn't. So this was a standalone intervention of providing free helmets, sometimes with education uh, added, that was then uh, analyzed in comparison to no intervention and, and then looking at observed helmet wearing. And then community-based interventions uh, were assessed on their own. But excellent question. So now if we just move on and look at self-reported helmet ownership and what did we find. And overall, uh, there was no impact on uh, self-reported helmet ownership for all of the interventions together. We see here an odds ratio of 2.67, but the confidence interval crosses 1. So it's, uh, the confidence interval is 0 0.89 and goes up to 8.03. Uh, however, when, um, when uh, those studies that looked at providing free helmets, we actually do see a, a very uh, large effect that is statistically significant in terms of the odds ratio is uh, over 11 times uh, more likely to self-report owning a helmet and uh, the range goes from 2.14 all the way to 63.16, and that's based on three studies. Uh, so in this instance, important that the reviewers did some sub-analyses uh, across the different types of interventions, and certainly the provision of free helmets seems to be really important uh, intervention at this point. So this is actually uh, another forest plot that's showing you overall. So overall, when we looked at the non-legislative interventions, so community-based, school-based, and the provision of helmets, including both free and subsidized, the overall finding, uh, as I just said in text in the previous slide, was 2.67, uh, but the confidence interval uh, just passes 1 to 0 0.89 to 8.03. Uh, you can see here the diamond, part of this is a scaling uh, issue, but you can see that the low, uh, the left-hand side of the diamond is, um, it looks in this picture like it's just touching one. In fact, if we had a different scale, uh, it uh, would, um, you know, 
it would definitely have crossed one and be just slightly on the other side of one. So I just wanted to show you what those overall results uh, look like there. And here we can also see uh, the two studies in particular, Brit and Wu, uh, had very large uh, effects there, whereas uh, the, all the other remaining studies show uh, no statistically significant uh, effect. So when we add all of, all of that together, we end up with the diamond as we see here. And now uh, for the last outcome, which is self-reported helmet wearing. Overall, the odds of self-reported helmet wearing were greater among those receiving the interventions. So we see an odds ratio of 3.27, ranging from 1.56 to 6.87. Um, interesting, these are uh, similar, but a little bit lower to what we saw overall for the observed. So that's an uh, interesting finding. Here we see um, specifically for school-based uh, interventions, the odds of uh, self-reported helmet wearing is 4.21, ranging from 1.06 to 16.64. That's coming from six studies. Also, they had uh, um, two studies that uh, looked at when the healthcare setting provided education around helmet wearing. So we see. Um, still a statistically significant positive effect, although not as large of an, uh, an impact. So we have an odds of 2.78, ranging from 1.38 to 5.61. And then again, still coming out very strongly, uh, the provision of free helmets. We have an odds of just over uh, 7 and a quarter, ranging from 1.28 to 41.44. That's coming from three studies. And also interesting and, and very worthy of note is in the provision of education only. We still are seeing here a statistically significant positive effect at just under two times more likely to self-report wearing a helmet. Um, the lower end of that confidence interval is approaching the line of no effect at 1.03, however, is still in the statistically significant range. And, in, and, and uh, while not, uh, I think, explained uh, uh, really well, what we do see here is uh, for children aged 11 years and older, we see a statistically significant positive effect on self-reported helmet wearing. So as you may recall, previously we found on observed helmet wearing, the intervention worked for those under 12. For self-reported helmet wearing, we see um, children over 11 um, reporting more helmet wearing. So that's interesting on, on its own, um, however a fairly uh, large impact here. And then just finally one more time to give you uh, one chan uh, another look at a, a similar type of forest plot. I'm actually going to be quiet for a second and let you take a look at this yourself and um, think about what it means to you and then I'll start talking in a moment. Uh, so just um, so I've given you a moment there, and uh, what, what's really important too, uh, I guess, because I actually love looking at these types of um, these types of uh, forest plots. So I would prefer to look at this than reading lots of text, and I'm hoping I can get a few of you convert a few of you to to think that way too. Um, but hopefully through this webinar, uh, you've focused in on one of those key things that you'd like to look at, and, and uh, um, so that these these types of diagrams can be uh, less intimidating. So again, here we. We do see our diamond uh, um, on the side of one that favors the intervention. It doesn't touch one, so it's statistically significant. And um, I haven't talked about this with the other outcomes, but one might ask themselves here, uh, you know, with an three three times greater odds of of wearing uh, of self-reported helmet use, and that ranging from one and a half times to close to seven, is that a big enough impact that uh, that would warrant wanting to invest in those types of interventions? So those are some of the types of questions that one would start to ask themselves in terms of interpreting uh, this this diamond. 
It's also important to uh, take a moment to talk about the uh, studies that were uh, excluded from this meta-analysis. So the, a meta-analysis is uh, exactly the same as a systematic review, only in the last step we statistically combine the findings from all of the individual studies to create that diamond. In a systematic review, we might not necessarily create that diamond. In this review, eight studies were excluded from that meta-analysis. Uh, for various reasons, but it's important to note that of those studies that were excluded, um, they found mixed effects on both the self-reported helmet ownership and observed helmet wearing uh, across the variety of intervention settings. So it, it uh, might, uh, it would also be important to uh, take a close uh, look at those studies, uh, who the populations were, what the interventions were that were being analyzed. Uh, in those studies, and it is important to note that uh, those those findings um, were mixed in terms of some finding a positive effect and some not. So if I just go back to really where we started is what does this all mean for public health? And so just to reiterate, it certainly appears from the data presented uh, in this review that community or school-based inter intervention should be promoted, supported, and or implemented to improve both observed and self-reported helmet wearing, that interventions focused on those uh, less than 12 years of age are definitely uh, a good thing to do to improve observed helmet wearing, that the provision of free helmets uh, uh, in addition with uh, education uh, is, is definitely uh, shining here as a really important intervention to be considered, uh, as well as not to, um, not to exclude the importance of healthcare settings as another uh, setting in which the promotion of uh, helmet wearing can be advocated for. Based on uh, a limited amount of uh, evidence, so uh, not a great number of studies and also the findings reported in the review, uh, subsidizing of helmets uh, isn't recommended. Um, with, uh, even with education, um, and non-legislative interventions if the goal is to increase the odds of self-reported helmet ownership. So again, that's important there. Uh, is it about helmet ownership or is it about wearing of helmets? Uh, what is the main outcome that uh, is of, of key interest uh, to guide your decision making? So I'll stop there, and uh, those, that's all of the, the data and um, implications for policy and practice uh, that we wanted to uh, report on today about the Owen Review, and I'll pause now to see if there are any questions, comments uh, that you would like, uh, I will do my best to address. Uh, so I just have a comment written here. The Bicycle Helmet Initiative is a very lovely one. My question is, how does this program, or what has been done to promote this initiative in African countries? Uh, so that's an uh, excellent question, and um, I, uh, I do not have an answer to that, unfortunately. I am not aware that any of the studies, well, actually, I am aware that the studies included in this review, uh, 18 came from the US, six from Canada, three from the UK, and one uh, from Australia. Uh, so the, we certainly don't have any evidence of um, studies of the effectiveness in African countries, but uh, certainly I, I think your question raises a, a good point about um, what, what can be done to promote this type of research uh, being done in those countries. So uh, not, not likely the answer you were hoping for, but the best one I can give you at the moment. And um, not really, I'm not seeing other questions coming in. I thank you for a really nice comment about liking going through the stats, uh, the forest plots, that's great. 
so an additional question is, did this study focus on low-income families or how accessible helmets are to uh, children, sorry, my screen's just moving, and adolescents in uh, different areas? So we're just taking um, a, a look into that right now. And sorry, I'm just having a note written for me as we've been looking this up. Um, there were no uh, subgroup analyses done by uh, level of SES in uh, in these studies. Uh, so it it uh, it seems that by and large the studies had a mix of children. And so I don't think uh, at this point there's an answer to that question from this particular review. But again, a really important uh, issue that you're raising here in, in terms of um, across, uh, across socioeconomic status, do these interventions have a similar effect? And, and that is an important um, question that does need to be answered in subsequent research. What you can do if you were to go to, if you downloaded the full review, uh, there will be a table that lists all of the studies included in this review and um, if you would generally see a, um, called it's called like a characteristics of included studies and in there you would be able to see more clearly exactly the populations included in each of those studies. Um, and then take a little uh, somewhat closer look if there are certain populations that align more closely to the ones that uh, you are providing services for. Uh, an additional question uh, is, do you think there is a benefit in educating and providing uh, free helmets? Well, um, what, what I would say is from um, from reading this review and thinking about what the implications are for policy and practice, certainly the, the most impactful intervention emerging from the literature at this point uh, is that the provision of free helmets um, uh, had the greatest impact on observed helmet wearing uh, as well as on self-reported helmet wearing. Uh, so it, it would appear from the data presented here that there definitely is benefit uh, in, in, in that being a supported public health intervention. Um, and so an, an additional question I'm just seeing here is, is the studies limited to children alone or don't you think it should be extended to all ages because in uh, Africa, for example, even the old ride bikes? Uh, um, excellent, excellent question. Uh, I'm sure um, an issue of debate in, in many, many questions around uh, legislation for uh, bicycle helmet wearing being limited to children versus anyone uh, uh, riding a bicycle or, or any other type of uh, mode of transportation that has wheels, one might say. Um, um, you know, and I, I certainly think that's an important uh, discussion and, and debate that um, many of us uh, could and should be in, engaged in. Uh, certainly, I would agree that you know the risks are certainly um, uh, high in terms of injuries uh, when you're not wearing a helmet. Um, what what we can say is that for this particular uh, review, these review authors focused on uh, these strategies. Uh, um, focused for children and adolescents and, and then used that outcome uh, uh, in terms of that age group. Um, uh, and, and in fact, you know, there's a, a fairly large number of studies included in this review in comparison to others, uh, other types of reviews where you only have two or three or four studies. So there's a growing body of evidence there and it, it might be that there's a, a separate review that has been done or should be done that looks at strategies to promote helmet wearing uh, in, in those older than 18. Um, I'm not aware if there is a Cochrane review that's been done on that. Certainly if someone is aware of that, please let us know. Um, but yes, I, I would agree that it's, a, it's an issue that likely needs much more discussion and debate. 
and there's a, a comment that has just come in, or um, well, comment question. Um, having a legislation that enforces helmet wearing could decrease injury, but if there is enforcement policy and standards, uh, this can increase helmet wearing. Do you not think? Um, and Certainly, I, I think that um, I guess it's in the enforcement of, of our legislation that, that uh, could be what leads to behavior change. Um, we, we can have um, legislation in place, but if there isn't a way to enforce it and there aren't, um, there, you know, there, there isn't a, a something to motivate you to, to change behavior, then how much change uh, do we get? So. Um, you know, that, that definitely is an important issue. Uh, and uh, Jenny just passed me a note to tell me that there is a Cochrane Review by McPherson et al. published in 2008 that evaluates uh, legislative interventions around bicycle helmet wearing. So that might be one, another one that you might want to look to as well. Uh, in the literature that might have some additional answers. So I don't see any other um, questions. Before I let you go, I just want to uh, talk to you about, um, uh, show you a couple of more slides. And we've just asked uh, you two additional questions. And one is, uh, did you find uh, the data um, helpful and were the findings new to you? So um, I'm just going to give you a second to answer those uh, questions. And also just to let you know that uh, we will be posting a copy of the presentation and the audio file on the Health Evidence uh, website over the next three to four days. So please uh, take a look out for that if uh, there are others in your organization that you think would be interested in uh, listening uh, to the webinar. And you, you just need to, if you haven't already uh, become a registered user of Health Evidence, you would need to register if you already are a registered user. You just need your username uh, and password to be able to sign on to this uh, specific uh, forum for um, to to uh, see the webinar um, uh, audio cast. Uh, so what I see here in terms of uh, the majority of you, well, should we, I can't, should say, well, it is the majority. The majority of you that uh, have, have felt that the findings today were helpful. And uh, most of you said that the findings were new. A few of you said that they weren't. And I also see that as a positive thing in terms of you were already up to date with what the literature was saying. So that's always uh, a positive, uh, positive finding. Um, the other thing, um, I'm actually um, hesitating here because we have been sending out a short uh, uh, link to a survey, a very short survey that we've been uh, conducting, evaluating the usefulness of, of these webinars. Um, we're not doing it for all of them, and so I'm questioning right now whether or not we are for this one. But just in case you are, uh, you do find an email from us. Um, it would be arriving in the next uh, few days, and it, I, I promise you it will not take you more than five minutes to do it. And it's really how we are, uh, we're, we're, we're just trying to determine whether or not these, uh, these webinars are a useful resource for the public health community and others in Canada and hear your thoughts on how we can continue to improve them. So if you do get that email, please take uh, five minutes to fill that out. And I just want to finish on a couple of slides uh, from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research um, and to let you know about a couple of initiatives that are going on there that are really relevant to the public health community. So uh, um, for the Canadian Institutes of Health Research Institute of Population and Public Health, uh, there's some funding opportunities. Uh, that are listed here. The first one is population health intervention research to promote health and health equity. Um, and this is, um, this is a funding uh, initiative uh, specific to the institution of population and public health and is something that is, uh, could be very relevant 
uh, for many public health departments across the country. And so encouraging you to go and, and, and I'll you know, give you in a moment where you can go to find more information. Just wanting you to be aware that these funding grants are available uh, and, um, uh, and we're encouraging you to go take a look to see whether or not you would be interested uh, in putting a proposal together. And then the, uh, the other three, those are across many institutes uh, of the 13 institutes that exist at uh, CIHR uh, that you would also have access to in terms of being able to submit grants to. And those are Knowledge Translation Awards, uh, Institute Community Support Grants and Awards, and also CIHR's Open Operating Grants Program. So just four uh, opportunities that uh, even as um, uh, members of the public health community, you still have uh, the ability to apply for funding for various initiatives under these different types of funding programs. And this is just one example of the, the first one on the previous list, so the population health intervention research example. One of the uh, proposals that was funded um, is the evaluation of traffic safety interventions in BC. And this study is looking at whether uh, the number of vehicle crashes has changed after changes to the province's Motor Vehicle Act. These findings will influence BC's road safety strategy and will be of interest to traffic safety lawmakers from other Canadian provinces and territories. So this is just uh, one type of example of the types of uh, projects that can be funded under the Population Health Intervention uh, Research uh, Initiative. And it highlights that the focus does not need to be specific to the health domain. Here the intervention is something that impacts health, but isn't necessarily a health, uh, uh, health intervention. And so finally, just where you can go, uh, this is the website. So ResearchNet is the website that CIHR uses uh, to inform uh, you of uh, the various uh, funding uh, granting proposals that are out there, uh, as well as where uh, you would find um, the types of online forms that you would need to complete in order to submit a grant. And also if you have questions, uh, and we do this all the time, if you have any questions whatsoever, it's always really good to contact uh, the specific folks at CIHR that are involved in these various funding mechanisms and for the um, for the population health intervention research funding competition in particular uh, this um, email address would be the the address you would use if you have any additional questions so I'll just pause there. Um, that's all that we have for you today. I'm uh, really glad that you were able to join us. We have an additional um, workshop coming up, or sorry, webinar coming up uh, next week uh, on, and of course now I'm going to get it wrong, this one is on limited literacy. So if that is of interest, um, you may want to uh, join up. I think there are still a few spots available at this point. And uh, we have an, an additional workshop, uh, I don't know, I have workshop on my mind today. I have an additional webinar coming up on uh, community-based um, um, physical activity interventions at the end of January where we will be having Dr. Philip Baker from Queensland, Australia, who is the author of the review, joining us. Uh, as well for that uh, webinar to talk a little bit more about what he learned in doing that uh, doing that review. Uh, so that that's it for today. If there aren't any further questions, then I will sign off and uh, hope that you've enjoyed the day and hope that we'll have you join us again. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>